I'm very pleased to be here today to introduce my colleague and friend, Dr. Lou Ritz, who will be doing our first keynote today. Uh, Dr. Ritz is on the faculty of the Department of Neuroscience in the College of Medicine and the McKnight Brain Institute. And his research has investigated techniques to um, alleviate the devastating effects of um, spinal cord injury. Uh, recently, uh, previous years, Dr. Ritz has focused on medical and graduate education. Uh, he's a course director of clinical neuroscience that second year medical students take. And he's co-author of a textbook, Medical Neuroscience. And based on his educational portfolio, he was selected as a member of the College of Medicine's Society of Teaching Scholars about 10 years ago. At the University of Florida, I also have the pleasure of serving with him in the Center for Spirituality and Health Executive Board. He's the executive director. Um, the center offers workshops, academic programs, research ventures that are interdisciplinary and explore the impact of spirituality and health. Um, at the um, undergraduate level honors program, he directs two courses, spirituality and health and neurotheology. Uh, his spiritual journey began in 1972 when he began meditating. And he has lectured on spiritual topics in the United States, Canada, and China. Over the past 10 years, he has traveled to India five times to study meditation at the feet of his mentor. In today's talk, Dr. Risa is going to present an overview of meditation, including the health benefits, the role of mindfulness of being present in stress reduction, the emerging science of meditation, based on modern neuroscientific methods uh, will also be introduced. And he will talk about neural networks thought to be important in attention and mind wandering. The concept of training our mind and brain circuits to alter our behaviors and ultimately to improve our lives will also be highlighted. Welcome, Dr. Ritz. Am I on? Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you, Anna, for the introduction. And I want to thank the people involved in the UF Mindfulness Day for uh, inviting me up here. <coughs> um, I went to uh, college in the late 60s and early 70s uh, in southwest Ohio. And it was a very tumultuous time in our country. And when I came out of college, <coughs> I was asking the four, what I consider the four most important questions people can ask. Who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going when I leave here? And what's my relationship to the Creator? And at that time, I took two paths. I decided I would take two paths to um, come up with the answers to these questions. And I'm still working on it, believe me. But um, the two paths were to study the central nervous system. I had been a physiology major as an undergraduate at Miami University in Oxford, Ohio. And um, so I was interested in physiology and general human physiology. But I also uh, got involved in meditation and spirituality. And uh, over the last 40 years, uh, one of those has become my profession and the other has become my passion. And uh, up till about 10 or 15 years ago, I really didn't speak about my two interests to the same group of people. But as you'll see from this talk today, as you'll see from this talk today, um, there are reasons that my interests have grown closer and closer together. So I'm going to start out with a quote. You may have seen this. I've been using this a lot. Other people have been using this a lot. It's from Lao Tzu from 3,000 years ago. If you're depressed, you're living in the past. If you're anxious, you're living in the future. And if you're at peace, you're living in the present. And I think it's very important for us to stay out of the past or stay out of the future as much as we can and uh, be at peace with ourselves by living in the current moment, by living mindfully. So I'm going to talk a little bit about meditation. 
I'm going to talk about meditation and stress reduction. And then I want to get into the science of meditation, including some of the more recent studies of the brain, just a few of the studies of the brain and meditation. And then we're going to talk about mind wandering. And we'll do this in about 35 minutes or so. So to start it with some definitions, uh, health, this is probably something that, that everybody is aware of. Health has a physical, emotional, mental, social, and spiritual components. Now, wellness to me is the ability to handle life's challenges at whatever age you're at. And at different ages, we have different challenges. But can we handle those challenges, hopefully uh, with a quiet mind and maintaining our inner peace? Spirituality, uh, I think the cleanest definition or the, most, the simplest definition of spirituality is becoming awake, being awake. Being awake to the present moment being awake to what's going on inside ourselves, being aware of what's going on in our side, inside ourselves, and beginning to be awake to something sacred that's within each of us. Now, one of, the, one of my favorite words that I use with medical students is salutogenesis. This word is the opposite of pathogenesis. Pathogenesis is the process of Disease. What are the factors that cause disease? Well, salutogenesis is what are the factors that keep us healthy? Uh, now, in a recent Time magazine, uh, there's an article on exercise, and in there they suggest that physicians two, three thousand years ago were suggesting diet and exercise for keeping their patients healthy, and I would say that's true to this day. But I would also add uh, living in the moment and using uh, meditation or contemplation to uh, incorporate into your life. This is a quote from um, Roger Walsh, who's an MD, PhD at the University of California, Irvine. The ultimate aim of spiritual, wake, uh, spiritual practices is awakening. That is to know our true self and our relationship to the sacred. And I think that's uh, the way I defined it a little bit earlier. However, spiritual practices also offer numerous other gifts along the way. The heart begins to open, fear and anger melt, greed and jealousy dwindle, happiness and love, happiness and joy grow, love flowers, peace replaces agitation, concern for others blossom, wisdom matures, and both psychological and physical health improve. So this gives a hint at uh, the broad-ranging consequences that a spiritual lifestyle, incorporating spirituality as best we can into our lifestyle, how it can impact our health, improve our health, can help us physically, can help us psychologically, and most importantly, it can help us spiritually. Now, this is a survey from about 10 years ago. Uh, at that time, uh, it was suggested that about 10% of Americans uh, have used meditation in one form or another. And for their definition in this article, meditation is a group of techniques uh, started in Eastern religions or spiritual traditions, but certainly it's available in Western traditions and it's available in secular forms also. In meditation, a person learns to focus his attention and suspend the, the stream of thoughts. And uh, it is believed that this will result in a state of greater physical relaxation, mental calmness, and psychological balance. And I would add spiritual connectedness. Now, the word meditation is like the word exercise. It's got lots of different meanings to a lot of different people. If a physician or a healthcare provider said to you, you need to exercise, you'd have to, you know, you'd have lots of choices. People come up to me and say, well, I'm interested in meditation. And I always say, what are your goals? You could be interested in relaxing the body. You could be interested in stress reduction. You could be interested in sharpening your attention to be able to focus on things a little better. You could be interested in uh, cultivating compassion. Um, you could be interested in so-called transcendent practices, practices that allow you to um, let me say, just gently say, go beyond the physical realm, uh, such as have been discussed in, uh, with near-death experiences. But in all cases, you have to be in the moment. If you're not in the moment, 
you're, you're going to miss the opportunity to have a good meditation. So this is uh, an article from Time Magazine uh, some two years ago or so, The Mindful Revolution. This has been going on in the United States now for a number of years. really started with John Kabat-Zinn in the late 1990s. He's a professor at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. And he coined the uh, phrase mindfulness, and he gave it the, the strict definition or sharp definition, paying attention in a particular way, on purpose, in the moment, and non-judgmentally. <clears throat> From that, um, people have started doing mindfulness uh, meditation, uh, a, a secular contemplative practice, for cultivating focused attention and self-awareness. And Kabat-Zinn parlayed this into an eight-week program called the Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction Program. Nancy Lassiter, who I believe was in here uh, the prior session, is trained in that. Uh, a number of uh, the counselors at the UF Counseling and Wellness Center are trained in uh, mindfulness-based stress reduction, and they offer something similar called Taming the Anxious Mind so I want to talk about stress reduction, just stress reduction, just a second. This is our grandmother, anybody's grandmother who will non-judgmentally uh, welcome us into her home, uh, no matter how we look or what we've done. Um, and to me, calm people have learned to not react. Now that doesn't mean they don't process a given situation, but they don't have this knee-jerk psychological reaction to life's challenges. To me, in order for stress to occur, there has to be two things. The first is a challenge in life. Now, challenges in life happen to all of us. They're not going to go away. That's just the nature of uh, life. Uh, the, uh, the second issue here is our response to those challenges, and that's what we can control. We don't have to go down an archer road and get mad at the traffic and then have a knee-jerk psychological response and come into work and be really uh, stressed out. Uh, we can begin to put a little bit of distance between the challenge and our response to that challenge. So I believe that meditation can help us decouple a psychological response. Now, uh, it's sort of a reflex, and reflexes need a stimulus and a response. And um, if we can put some separation between the stimulus and response, we can, we can mute the response to some degree. To me, uh, stress is optional. Now, some people would argue that it's beneficial if you want to be motivated, and I would say, um, there are other ways to be motivated that doesn't involve stress. But certainly reducing stress in our lives is good for our health. And this is just a little picture showing if you put some, uh, uh, without mindfulness, you just go through life and you have a stimulus and a response, a psychological reflex, as, as I've been mentioning. But with mindfulness, with meditation, you can separate those a little bit. It's sort of like thinking before you speak. And in this case, you're going to, mute your reaction before you have a full-blown uh, psychological stress response. Now, this is, you know, I talk to medical students about this, and so this slide is, relates specifically to medical students, but in general, I think we can relate to many of the things that I say here. Um, um, meditation and mindfulness, uh, it's important for self-reflection and self-awareness. We need to know what's going on in our internal landscape. A lot of people go through life and they don't realize they're angry or they're anxious or they're depressed. They're not aware of the state of their internal landscape. And meditation is a mirror to our internal uh, condition. Um, this will, uh, mindfulness can help us uh, reduce stress. It can give us a greater focus, in particular for students for studying or for any of us for studying. Then comes the part where we're interacting with other people. I think mindfulness techniques can, can allow us to be present with other people. And for medical students, that's important for being present with your patients. Patients know when a young physician is not present with them. 
Uh, when we go out to dinner with somebody, we know if they're not present with us. It's, we all know that. If, uh, uh, when people are somewhere else or doing something else, they're not paying attention uh, to the conversation. Um, we, we're aware of when uh, people aren't with us. It also, um, meditation can enhance uh, uh, listening skills, again, which I think is so important for interacting with patients or our friends. And finally, something that's pretty specific to the medical students or any healthcare provider, but um, it has to do with patient safety, which has been in the news a lot these days. And uh, I think attentive physicians are less likely to make a mistake. Okay, I'm going to switch gears a little bit. And this is, a, uh, this is a Newsweek magazine that came out four or five years ago, and they're highlighting 1968. And they were talking about some of the things that were going on in 1968. And uh, it was um, a time when there was a very unpopular war going on in this country. There was a, uh, it was uh, the year that uh, Martin Luther King and uh, Robert Kennedy were assassinated. Um, and it was the year I graduated from high school, so I took note of that. And um, what was interesting is that there's an article in here about something that happened. Uh, the Beatles went to India. The Beatles went to India in 19, the spring of 1968. So um, Sharon Begley gave, wrote an article on how the Beatles going to India in 1968 impacted science, and what she was really talking about is the science of meditation. So the Beatles got interested in meditation. They got interested in their spiritual development. They went and they studied with uh, transcendental uh, meditation with their teacher, and it's as if they gave permission for the people in Europe and the United States, West, the Western culture, to begin to think about meditation. Now, certainly people were meditating before 1968 the Beatles, when the Beatles went, went to uh, India, but they, uh, they popularized it and people got involved in transcendental meditation. And this is our heroes. Um, uh, from left to right, we got Paul and George. The young people in the audience may not know who these guys are, so I've got to tell you. <laughs> I've asked a lot of young people, and they don't, they don't know who these guys are. So anyways, Paul, John, George, and Ringo, and their teacher. Um, now, what, what is significant to the story that I'm telling today is that uh, three years later, um, an article came out in Scientific American, uh, which was called The Physiology of Meditation. And these researchers actually studied transcendental meditation and its effect on the body. And this, the research, one of the researchers was Robert Wallace, and this was his dissertation work at UCLA. And Herbert Benson is a cardiologist. I believe he's still at Harvard. And uh, they dubbed this state, the physiological state, a hypometabolic state. The body is really relaxed. The body has um, decreased oxygen consumption, uh, decreased heart rate, decreased blood pressure, that sort of thing. This is a picture of, uh, that was from that original Scientific American article of a guy meditating, and uh, they're, they're doing EKGs and galvanic skin responses to measure the amount of stress or sweating. Um, they are uh, blood gases and respiration rates. And when I was 21 or 22 years old, I thought this was the coolest picture in all of biomedical science. Um, he also had in his, Robert Wallace in his dissertation, had this chart showing transcendental meditation impacting the hypothalamus, impacting uh, the brainstem, and in particular the autonomic nervous system, um, presumably deactivating the, the, autonom uh, the, the sympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system, reducing stress, and activating the parasympathetic division, hopefully increasing our relaxation. And so this is all pretty accurate even to by today's standards. But what's interesting to me are these black lines. How could a mental process somehow affect the brain and have lasting effects on the brain? That's an interesting question. 
Uh, now, more recently, and I like to put a plug in for my friend Jim Austin, uh, I think the modern era of the study of meditation and the brain started with Jim Austin's book called Zen and the Brain. Jim Austin is a physician, a retired physician. He was the chair of neurology at the University of Colorado um, in uh, Denver. And uh, when he was... Uh, um, when he was uh, uh, on a sabbatical in Japan, he wandered into a Zen uh, temple in Kyoto, and he quickly recognized that these people were doing something he had never seen before, and they were using the mind in a way that he had never considered before. And he started studying Zen meditation, and uh, he came out with Zen in the Brain, which is... Uh, a uh, major work, uh, I think about 1998. He's since published four more books. Jim is 92 years old, and he is the sharpest thinking individual. I mean, he's so crisp uh, uh, that it's amazing. He, he, I know him because he winters here in Gainesville. He spends most of his year in Columbia, Missouri, but he comes to Gainesville usually for two or three months in the winter, and he's a delightful individual to spend time with. More recently, this term meditation has been coupled with the word science, the science of meditation. Again, Time Magazine and Heather Bram on the cover. This was, oh, this was 10 years ago or so. Scientific American and is also, Scientific American Mind is also talking about the science of meditation. Meditation science. So people are beginning to look at it a little differently. The science of meditation. Can we study meditation scientifically? To me, um, when we when think about science and meditation, there are several different layers to this. The first is what's going on in the brain and, and body during meditation. And this is actually the started, the studies were started um, um, with uh, the physiology of meditation more than 40 years ago. Uh, and are there long-term effects, or do they only, are the effects only during meditation? The second one, I think, has gotten a lot, the second level is, I think, has gotten a lot more interest these days. Can meditation be used as a therapeutic intervention uh, for pain, for depression, for neurodegenerative diseases, for cognitive decline, for addiction? And then the third, um, the third point is how do we study subjectively the effects of meditation? Uh, you could call it the science of inner discovery. How do, we, how do we use the scientific method to help ourselves in our own meditation? Um, I think that's a question we can all ask. An interesting book was published about 2006 uh, the Dalai Lama, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, had gotten together with some of the top neuroscientists uh, in the world. They, were, they came from all over the world to meet with him and to talk about neuroplasticity. Can the brain change under different conditions? What are the factors that affect the brain as we go through life? And the Dalai Lama uh, asked this simple little question. Can the mind change the brain? And one way to look at it, and certainly not the only way, and, uh, but some people like to think of the mind as software and the brain as hardware. So we all have pretty much the same hardware, but we certainly have vastly different software depending on our life's experiences. And can the mind turn on certain circuits and turn off other circuits? That remains to be uh, revealed. Train your mind, change your brain. So Dalai Lama has never been one to be afraid to embrace science. I think he's got an engineering background. I'm not totally sure. But um, um, Buddhism, um, I think, is largely consistent with a scientific approach, especially to meditation. And um, uh, whereas other religions may... It is said that other religions may result in faith. Buddhism, the goal of Buddhism is to result in insight into personal experience that will help us understand some of the deeper truths of life. So these are some more recent pictures about monks being studied 
in MRI tubes. And this is Richie Davidson uh, here. He is, I would say, the foremost neuropsychologist uh, in America. And he has about $20 million in research monies from the NIH and other institutes. He has, an inst he has a center called the Center for Investigating Healthy Minds at the University of Wisconsin. Davidson had gone to India when he was younger and had all sorts of trouble dragging um, heavy equipment up the hills uh, in the foothills of Himalayas. And he, he would find monks in caves, and they thought it was nuts. Why would you want to use all this equipment to study meditation. They just said, leave, leave me alone. I just want to meditate in a cave. And so finally, the Dalai Lama realized, well, maybe if he sent monks to Wisconsin, if the Dalai Lama helped send some monks to Wisconsin, they could get more work done. And so they'd been doing a lot of work over the years. And uh, here's the Dalai Lama inspecting somebody, appears to be inspecting someone going into an MRI tube to have their brain scanned. And here's Richie Davidson with one of his subjects where they put a halo of um, maybe 128 electrodes on the head to, to measure brain activity. So some of the early work from Richie Davidson suggests that meditation can have an effect on positive affect. The, po the positive affect has been, excuse me, positive affect has been uh, linked to activity in the left frontal lobes that we know that from stroke data, when people have strokes in their left frontal lobes, they, tend, they can be depressed and their, the joy seems to go out of their life. And uh, both EEG work and PET scans have shown that the left frontal lobe is activated by certain meditations. And uh, this is coupled with uh, reports of a, of a positive affect to people. And um, psychiatrists have been be are beginning to use transcranial magnetic stimulation. This is using magnets to set up electrical currents that will um, activate the brain to help with uh, intractable depression by stimulating the left frontal lobes. More recently, be people have begun to look at the anatomy of the brain based on meditation. And uh, this is a paper, again, uh, these are all papers in the last 10 years. Meditation experiences associated with increased cortical thickness. They took two groups, people, control group, and a, a group of meditators. They were age matched. And, and as it turns out, the meditators had thicker core areas of the cortex. And so that suggests that maybe meditation protects us from age-related brain atrophy. Uh, and this could be part of what's called cortical plasticity. Um, it wasn't the best experiment because there wasn't before and after studies, uh, so we don't really know if the meditators had thicker brains to begin with than the non-meditators. So more recently, people are, are doing before and after. So they're, doing, they're, they're looking at people's brains, and then they're giving them the eight-week mindfulness-based stress reduction program, and then they image the brains afterwards. They image them before the eight-week program, after the eight-week program, and they're finding increases in the hippocampus, which is so important for memory, and in other areas of the cortex. So there's hints that this, may, this meditation is changing the brain and helping with um, learning and memory, helping with emotional regulations. This is a little bit of a complicated study, but I'll, I'll try to summarize it. Basically, they took some individuals and they gave them a very intense thermal stimulation on the leg, a stimulation that was deemed really, uh, really intense, really unpleasant. But they found out, and they had various controls, but they found out subjectively, they found out from the individuals that during meditation, again, the eight-week uh, I'm sorry, again, a version of mindfulness meditation that during meditation that the subjectively the stimulus, which was constant, the stimulus had a much uh, reduced intensity and the stimulus had a reduction in its unpleasantness. They coupled this with brain scans, and I'm not going to go into the details of these brain scans here, but basically with meditation, you've got certain areas of the brain that are activated, certain areas of the brain that are deactivated. 
And a lot of it has to center around the anterior uh, cingulate cortex and the anterior insula. These are areas that are known to be involved in pain processing, known to be involved in emotional processing. Somehow a short meditation experience is allowing these people to activate certain parts of their brain which allow uh, the, a reduction in the, sub, in the experience of pain. What I like about this study, and I think it's a model for other studies, is there's both the subjective component and an objective component. So they did the subjective component when they asked the, the subjects, you know, what were you experiencing? What, what was the intensity? What was the unpleasantness level? So that's a subjective part of this study. But they also have the objective data, which is what I'm showing you here, what's going on in their brain during these experiences. So I think as we go forward, if we can do studies that we couple subjective and objective observations, we can begin to have a better understanding of how uh, pain might be uh, managed with meditation. The last thing I wanna, as far as studies go, I think this is pretty interesting. This is a study looking at mind wandering. So let's just look at the center box here for a second. We have four states that a person can go through. Now they're, they're, they're in an MRI tube and they're asked to focus on something. So they focus on something and then their mind wanders. This happens to all of us all the time. Um, you, you're watching a movie, your mind wanders. You're reading a textbook, your mind wanders. You're listening to your significant other, your mind wanders. Um, so our mind wanders. Then you become aware of the mind wandering, and then you shift back to your focus. So it's as if there's the brain can be in these two different states, uh, a state of focused attention or a state of mind wandering. And, um, and they begin to, uh, by monitoring these subjects, they begin to find which areas of the brain are active during each of these four steps. And I would say that, again, each of, this is the, the pattern that we use through life, where we focus on something and stick to the task, and then we realize we're off task, where our mind is wandering, and then we have to shift our attention back to the task. Um, of course, people who are who have stronger attention, uh, can, can maintain the focus longer, and have less intrusion by mind, wa mind wandering. Well, as it turns out, these, this focus versus mind wandering are different circuits or different networks in the brain. Uh, we have an intentional network that allows us to stay on task, to stay in focus. These tend to be more lateralized components in the parietal and frontal lobes. And then we have a mind wandering component in which, you know, the mind is just running on its own. Um, so people have begun to study this mind wandering component. They've actually given it a name, the default mode network. Um, it was originally found when, um, when, they, when they did some early MRI studies on people on attention tasks, they would do with the study and then they would tell the people, relax, uh, we're gonna take a break. Relax for the next 10 minutes. Just stay where you are in the tube and stay relaxed. And um, what they found was, they kept imaging the people while they were supposedly relaxing from their attention task. And um, they discovered that a, a different circuit was being active when people were at risk and their minds were actually wandering and they call this the default mode network. And it's associated with uh, self-centered thoughts about the past or the future. Interestingly, if you study mind wandering, people are most unhappy when their minds are wandering. Focused people are happy, unfocused people, people who are in the past, in the future, going back to our original Lao Tzu quote, People who are, have mind wandering tend to be unhappy. Um, you can try it for yourself on a scientific experiment. Just ask yourself if you're happy or unhappy when next time you spend some significant uh, time mind wandering. Um, as I said, it's, it's, it's not correlated or anti-correlated with the activity of attentional networks. 
And there's been suggestions that the default mode network is activated during uh, certain psychiatric uh, disorders. Okay, so I'm going to kind of sum this up with a couple slides. Uh, to me, the mind is the biggest challenge in life. It's a matter of fact, I would suggest it's the only challenge that we really have. If we can have a mind that's happy, a mind that's quiet, we can go through life w with, some, uh, with some ease, I would suggest. I got an email some years back from a physician who was coming to town and he was interested in spirituality and he said, I'm trying to find somebody who has a profoundly quiet mind. And um, I wasn't sure where to point him to. So anyways, it's something we can strive for. The mind tends to be reactive. It's been reactive since probably we were two years old and it's still reacting to everything we've done. Um, the analogy that our guest this afternoon, Mickey Singer, likes to use is that uh, it's like um, doing a search on your phone, doing a Google search on your phone or on your computer and you ask it, you ask it a question and um, uh, it, it not only gives you your answer, but for the next 10 weeks it keeps sending you answers to an old question or an old situation. Uh, the mind likes to cling to things, um, uh, just like pop tunes stick in our head, so-called earworms. Uh, the mind likes to take us out of the moment. And the mind is very chatty. It's, uh, it's like having an inner roommate. It wakes you up at 4 in the morning, and there it is, talking to you. So um, what I think a lot, of, um, a lot of the meditation techniques depend on the fact that the mind is plastic. We can alter the mind. Um, through changes, through using meditation, we can have changes in our thought patterns, which bring about changes in our brain circuitry, which ultimately change our behaviors, and ultimately, and then beyond that, we have improvement in our lives. Now, the other day, a medical student asked me about these, some sort of technology that plays different frequencies of sounds into the ears to try to alter brain circuit. And I said, it's, it's my idea that we have to change the way we think. If we want to improve our lives, bring about any of the improvements that meditation talks about, we have to change our thought processes. You can't, I don't believe you can bypass the thought process and go directly to the brain, but I'm the, the, I think the jury is still out on that. So I'm a, for my final slide, I'm, I'm borrowing an image from our friend Alex Gray, who's been here a number of times, medical illustrator, uh, um, and um, uh, really has some wonderful art. But this is his depiction of uh, body, mind, or mind and psyche, and um, spirit. So I believe that meditation can help us clean up our internal environment, but we have to be aware of what's going on in our internal landscape to be able to work on it, get rid of the polluting emotions, uh, and, and help us improve our thought patterns, conserve our ability to focus. To me, our ability to focus and maintain a focus is our most precious resource and ultimately unblock our access to something that's sacred deep within each of us. And as long as this mind psyche is in turmoil or hyperactive or whatever you want to call it, you're sort of blocked from spirit. But if this becomes clear, this, be this mind psychic becomes um, calm, then I believe we can access um, uh, something special that's with deep within each of us. And to me, that is the ultimate role or the ultimate goal of meditation. So I want to thank you for your attention. And um, I'm not sure where we go from here, whether we have questions or... So thank you. Spina, help me out. Do we have questions now, or do you want to? You can talk to me individually, or maybe there's no questions. Let's. Can we use this? I can speak up. Well, I want to make sure it gets on the video. Test 15, and it takes 
Well, I'm not sure that I would suggest that. I'm not sure all the researchers would suggest that, that there's somehow a link between the mind and the brain, whether they're one and the same or whether the distinct. Okay, so I was basically, my question is, is there what scientific evidence or research done or some some evidence that suggests that the brain? That drives brain activity from outside the brain? Is that I don't know if there's any Western research to that, but I think there's a lot of Eastern meditative research that's done on that that suggests that there's some force, we'll call it our will, call it our intention, call it our attention, that is really what is controlling the processes that are going on. So that's my best suggestion. Thanks for speaking with us. This was really great. Um, I had a question. Uh, if we wanted to almost duplicate some of the practices in some of the papers that you showed, um, is there a way to do that? For, in particular, I'm curious about transcendental transcendental meditation. I think it was the, the ones the Beatles did. Is there like a practitioner you recommend we for a book? Or? Uh, as far as transcendental meditation goes, that was very popular in the 70s. I'm not really sure of its status right now. Maybe, can anybody help me out in the... Still around here? I would... Um, I can't say for transcendental meditation. I can't recommend anybody okay. here in town. Uh, I would think by Googling these these practices, you can find out what's happening in Gainesville. And maybe, again, maybe other people here can um, help you out with what's happening. I mean, we have, uh, we have a student organization called the Moore Club. We have uh, um, a Create Club. So there are some student clubs around. And there's, starting with Mickey Singer and the Temple of the Universe, there's, there's lots of uh, different uh, meditation and spiritual and yogic paths around Gainesville. The, the, the question I have is, when I've, I've looked up papers on meditation on Google Scholar, and sometimes, maybe it's just that you can't tell from the abstract, but they, they sometimes don't mention the meditation method they use. They'll just say, mindfulness was used. Right, right. And certainly even mindfulness has a broad definition. I mean, it could be a, they could be doing a lot of different things. So that's... That's still a flaw or problem with a lot of Western science. Well, thank you for your time. Yeah, there are also many um, meditation groups in town. We are the rich things and the rich things spiritual center over here. Yeah, that's so rich. If you go to your mindfulness websites, okay. there are many meditation groups listed, including uh, Vipassana, Shambhala, um, and various times. So, because there are differences, But what was different about it 
make up one. But you were you were told that you could not reveal your monster to anyone. Um, you know, and really, like if you keep going on for years and years, you discover it's just like any other kind of meditation, really. Um, you know, eyes closed, eyes open, candles, whatever. It, it was all kind of the same. My concern was so I actually found a, a citation that says the transcendental meditation um, changes activity in the basal ganglia, which are related to the limbic system and anxiety. So I was seeking help with anxiety. And so I was probably because I have anxiety, I was wondering, well, if I don't know if I'm doing the right type of transcendental meditation, maybe I won't be getting the same effect that they got in that study. But I'm, you know, I'm, I have tried other methods and I'm willing to try what I'm hearing from these other people. So if that's, you know, if that's as specific as we can get, you know, it's fine. Thank you. One more question. Well, thank you, Sabina. Thank you, everyone, for coming today.